had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning them. Okay. As we have an apparent serious oxygen leak. Welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we take you through all the mistakes, failures, and explosions that made modern space exploration possible. I am your host, just me this time, Quinn, and I am joined today in the, in the Trash Future live studio, which is incredible, uh, Joe and Tom, who are the hosts of Lines Led by Donkeys podcast, where they cover bad military history, failed battles, horrible commanders, all of that kind of stuff. I do not really know why I'm introducing you guys because <laughs> our listenerships are not like there's there's not just a Venn diagram. Like our listenerships are a tiny circle completely inside of a bigger circle. <laughs> it's a sphere. <laughs> yeah. It's a content sphere. You're in you're in the Velvet <laughs> Content Goon Cave right now, so you know. You invented it. It's just spreading now. <laughs> it's like venereal disease among 18th century sailors. Or like most goon caves, I assume. Yeah. Uh, Instead of like a a jar, it's just an entire content studio. This is throwing me off too, because the hostel where I'm staying right now is also aggressively purple. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just like, I'm... (laughs) And it's not like they planned this, because there's like so many, like you have this random fucking rug that looks like it belongs in like my grandmother's living room. You have to have the purple panels, the purple curtains, purple panels, and you get the white panels on the ceiling. I feel like that they tried to plan it and then just said, fuck it. Yeah. I mean, like, are we just playing the game of let's talk about things we can see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're, 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 you're not obscuring yourself behind the cloud of vape smoke. I must disappear now. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for coming on. Uh, this is going to be a really fun one, I think. So I'm, I'm actually going to start this off with a question. Joe, Tom, I think mostly Joe. Do you remember the movie Iron Sky? Oh, God, yeah. There's a Nazis we did a, on the Moon. We did a bonus Nazis episode the about that a long yeah. time ago. And do you remember how every nation had, like, uh, they were revealed to have an orbital, like, ultra-advanced battle fleet, and, like, the mirror had a laser cannon on it? Yes. What if I told you that was alarmingly close to the truth? Fuck yes. Oh, uh, the only people who are stupid enough to actually try and build that is uh. either going to be the British or the Soviets or the Nazis, but they would do it in a weird way that also like feeds into like a weird officer's fetish now now as the american delegation of this table don't count us out of this we once had a plan to simply nuke the moon for no reason yeah Yeah, but like that was that was all you know uh propagated by former nazi scientists so like it's a venn diagram not the circle i mean the same could be said for a lot of the fucking failed soviet experience they had their own paperclip and it was bigger (laughs) (laughs) it's the soviets building a giant paperclip and just being they, carried they by fundamentally the... misunderstood what Operation Paperclip was. Uh, they're, they're like running into battle. There's 60 soldiers holding it like bent outwards like a lance. If they have the same weapon I use to switch out the SIM card on my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, today we are going to be talking about the Soviet Death Star and really just the whole history of the, so- the militarization of space by the Soviets because it's, it's fucking stupid. Uh, I, mean, I, like... I assume the crack the military minds of the Soviet Union were like, how can we build the space station out of nothing but the conscript? Yeah, I can't wait to see what a space station built by the world's hairiest man called Yosef. Oh, okay. Yo- <laughs> hey, hey, I'm sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think oh, the M in MIG stands for? Motherfucker's Armenian. <laughs> we share shoulder hair, buddy. <laughs> Joseph Josabian. <laughs> Just hair was actually a big concern for early space exploration, though. This is why like, Armenians you, never you, went like, to space. Shave, it's just like any kind of shaving of hair is just going to like get into the electronics and just fry everything. This is, this is why Armenia doesn't have a space program. Actually, <laughs> okay, funny thing aside, they do, and they launch like a, like they got like a private company to launch a satellite. And everybody immediately um, took the, because it was just like a box, right? It's like the, it's, it's a cube set. Yeah. yeah. It's a, and uh, everyone immediately started photoshopping this company called VBET. 
on the side of it because like it's a it's a betting company. I believe it's actually Georgian. And uh, no, sorry, Ajara bet is Georgian. But anyway, they photoshopped betting ads all over it because at the same time, like VBet sponsored like everything in the country from like football teams to like <laughs> you, if you went in the metro and you went down the fl- like the escalator, like literally every meter. There was a VBET sign. So, like, everybody just photoshopped the VBET thing on the satellite. <laughs> like, wow, well, we, have, we have space program. The Armenian space station is just built entirely out of cigarettes and brandy. Fuck yeah. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So that's something I completely forgot to bring. I'm putting myself onto a tangent now, which is not my job, but the only, the only alcohol that is regularly consumed in space is Armenian brandy. So we did make it to yeah, space, they, baby. They do, they do not send vodka. Like, uh, the ISS right now has several bottles of Armenian brandy. I, I can't remember the name of it. Probably Ararat. Yeah. yeah. Which is, like, the best one, in my opinion. It's also, like, surprisingly affordable, like $20 a bottle. Now I'm just thinking about the Armenian version of uh, Mr. Freeze from Batman Forever, but instead of, like, the cooling liquid, it's just brandy. <laughs> That's just every Armenian taxi driver. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, making my Armenian gaming PC and replacing the water cooling with just brandy running through it. <laughs> it's cooled by brandy and the filters are pure back <laughs> yeah, it's just Yeah, like it runs through its open cycle, so there's just a tube leading into my mouth the whole time. <laughs> and, in, it, and in order to power it, there's actually just like pedals on the ground. You have to pedal power it. <laughs> Powered by our fucked up nuclear power plant that's uh, uh, like a health crisis to us all just by existing around it. (laughs) It's also immediately so much easier to podcast with people in the room. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Like we recorded an episode of uh, our show in here yesterday and I was like, I kind of forgot what this was like. Normally I exist in this weird (laughs) content cupboard that only I sit in and I yell at voices on the computer. Yeah, your neighbors just think you're going insane over there. <laughs> I assume so, yeah. Yeah, I think this guy next door, he's really schizophrenic. He keeps talking to himself. He's just yelling about goon caves all the time. <laughs> he's talking about jilking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and for sourcing for this, I'll mostly be using the book Buran Energia by Bart Hendricks and Bert Vies. I don't, uh, Bert Viss, whatever. Uh, along with a handful of websites and space history blogs. As always, all links will be in the show notes. The first thing to go over with this story is that the Soviet space program as a singular thing didn't really exist. Uh, Not something like NASA. It was actually a bunch of competing uh, groups called Experiment and Design Groups, or OKBs. We must get to uh, space first or else that gay pedophile Pietor from (laughs) Vladivostok is going to get there first. Like, let's be honest here, nobody from Vladivostok's building a rocket. (laughs) They're not (laughs) building a rocket. Vladivostok either. If if you get assigned to, like, OKB 69 at Vladivostok, (laughs) your career is fucking over. and, And what's weird is that, like, they ran a, almost a more capitalist space program than NASA because uh, NASA started with all of these competing, like the Air Force, the Navy, and um, the Army all competing, mm-hmm. and it fucking and it's why they didn't get to space first. So they made a centralized thing. The Soviets had this like every one of these OKBs basically just worked like a military contractor. Like, oh god, the Kremlin would put out a contract that say we want to go to the moon, and then all the OKBs would compete with each other to actually do that, and. Because of how specialized the OKBs could be, like, uh, for example, um, one OKB famously made all of the engines for all of the different rockets. So if you, like, they, you could fuck each other over, and if they didn't like each other, um, like, OKB1, Korolev, the most famous one, Hmm. he famously got in trouble with Glushko, the head of the engine manufacturer. They both got each other sent to the gulag. They both, it was the, it's the weirdest <laughs> hey, fucking I'm thing. I'm going down, I'm taking you they, with me, motherfucker. They both accused each other of treason, and instead of picking one to be good and one to be bad, they just threw both of them in the same gulag, and they continued, like, other gulag guys are like, yeah, they were fucking bickering the whole time, like, they would have Imagine bickered Imagine being right the most the annoying guys squad. in the gulag. That's the most yeah. Soviet-ass problem-solving on Earth, is like, no, you both go to gulag. Hey, comrade Korolev, you say I am gay? I say you are gay. Just breaking I- rocks the whole time. <laughs> I will see you for our daily card game at five. <laughs> we will sit around and spit sunflower seeds on the ground for hours. There is like a kind of weird comrade camaraderie 
between like being the two most annoying guys in the prison and hating each other. Yeah. Well, it's like the famous story of like the last uh, Jewish guy in Afghanistan that got arrested by the Taliban and they let him go because he was so fucking annoying. <laughs> There's like a superpower to that. They're just sitting in the last synagogue in Afghanistan calling each other gay the whole time. Yeah. They uh, fucking hated one another. I was going to ask, was that Nate? <laughs> <laughs> you have to cut that. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, so, so basically, yeah, the Soviet space program, it like... It would all be put together by cooperation between a bunch of mini corporations, uh, corporations with their own funding streams, design philosophies, and like we talked about, leaders who fucking hated each other. Mm-hmm. Leftist infighting. I don't believe exactly. it. Yeah, <laughs> literally <laughs> doing tendency infighting. <laughs> Rocket struggle sessions all around. Rockets guided by the principles of Lenin. You know, oh, is it going to crash into Eastern Europe? <laughs> The entire <laughs> rocket is built out of the world's shortest and widest Georgian men <laughs> holding arm in arm around a giant bundle of fireworks. Oh. Yeah, I know we talked about going to space, but instead all I'm going to do is fuck up the, the fringes of the former empire, but communistly this time. Audience, we will talk about it sometime, but there is just a field in Kazakhstan downrange from Baikonur that is literally just like there's black splotches all across it from all the stages they drop in it. And it is just owned by some farmer. <laughs> <laughs> I farm dead rockets. It ain't much, but it's a living. That's, <laughs> that's literally a way you can make money in Kazakhstan because these rockets are all made of like fucking like titanium and really valuable alloys. So people will just go out, steal entire rocket stages. It's better than the other thing the Soviets left in Kazakhstan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned the gulags. Um, a lot of these OKBs grew out of the Shiraga system, which were these were basically gulags for nerds. Uh, so if you were smart <laughs> and you got sent to a gulag, they, they was like, uh, during World War II, a lot of the Soviet aircraft and fighters and whatnot were designed in these shiragas, just guys like chained to their drafting Mikian tables. Was sent to one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Korolev goes to one of these things. This guy we're going to talk about, Chalamet, goes to these, like all of these guys are in prison. Uh, getting like horribly abused and designing rockets at the same time. It's kind of a minor miracle that any of this shit worked. Like, and they have to have like, gotten it into their head the prison stuff so they're like all of the food is prison food all like all the design elements are just like scrawled onto like a random piece of paper you found i mean to be fair prison food is just what you call russian food to okay this day. fair fair <laughs> i was gonna say probably like russian space food was just modeled after prison food it's like you you americans have nutri love in russia we have borek vodka all dehydrated and put up your ass before you go in the rocket it's all just mayo-based salads. <laughs> the mayo fuel <laughs> rocket. Getting a toothpaste tube full of mayo and you just squirt it into your helmet. That, that is more accurate than you can imagine. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of these OKBs. They all fucking hate each other. But for the sake of this story, we'll be focusing on two principal space OKBs. So there's OKB-1 under Sergei Korolev and OKB-52 under Vladimir Chelomey. As the space race starts heating up in the 60s, it also sets off a rivalry that'll actually still last to today. Both of these OKBs are companies in Russia that fucking hate each other. Um, and they're like, the two, Soviet, the two Russian rockets that are being launched right now are both like fully 60 years old and still in use. That tracks. And one of them is made by OKB-1, and one of them is made by 52, and they just could never afford to replace them. And now instead of getting in, like, actual argumentative beefs, they just report the other one for... They have employees that haven't been drafted yet. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, audience, listen to our Uran Battalion episode about how uh, the Russian space agency is just recruiting scientists to go die in Ukraine. Yeah, that episode was longer than the lifespan of, yeah. a, of a normal conscript. <laughs> So yeah, we got OKB-1 and OKB-52, and Korolev and Chalamet also hate each other on a personal level. There's examples of them, like, fully fighting anytime they meet. Like the, like the Chinese rocket program? Yeah. yeah that we, <laughs> like, we talked about just, like, roving gangs of fucking nerds beating the shit out of each other. I still support that as a space program. Yeah, like... Put NASA to work. Not a, not in the lab, but, like, in the streets. Yeah, they need to get, like, Burt Reynolds. So, like, well, Burt Reynolds is dead, isn't he? Is he still alive? I feel like he's probably dead. Uh, like if get, he's not, he will be. Get the ghost of Burt Reynolds to star in it, like the Soviet version of The Longest Yard. <laughs> that, mean, that means you could also possibly put Adam Sandler in this film. <laughs> and I like that idea better. Killing a rival space uh, scientist and then dissolving his body in hypergolic fuel. Put it, put it in the rocket, it gets burned, the evidence is gone. The perfect crime. <laughs> the perfect crime. This is why I haven't been caught yet. <laughs> in space, no one can 
find out your murders. <laughs> that does make me wonder, like, what crimes have occurred in space that we just don't know about? I don't know if it's a crime, but, like, the first Soviet stations, there has been a line brawl in space. It's pretty fun. <laughs> you just go and throw a punch and hit the guy, and he just, like, slowly yeah, floats but like, away. But these guys are actually, like, good at zero-G by then, so there's, like, they're describing this fight where they're fully doing some, like, superhero stuff. They're putting, like, their feet against the walls. They're pushing off and, like, diving, tackling another guy. It's, it's like, full-on, like, uh, like, Chinese wushu wire combat. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing, like... Neo shit in real life. <laughs> I mean, if you count counter uh, contraband as crimes, then there's a shitload of contraband on the ISS right now. I wonder who's the first person to smuggle something like really illegal. Like, there's the obvious like porno mags, the liquor. It's like, a all right, which one of you guys exploded. packed heroin? Yeah, dude's just like <laughs> shooting open zero G. <laughs> it like re it really affects the high because the blood can't flow around normally. <laughs> just nodding out and flying around. <laughs> <laughs> you're just you're, you're just doing like. What if Fent train spotting had a higher budget? <laughs> you're doing like the fentanyl slump where you're just like floating uh -oh. around. <laughs> well, I know that fentanyl's up there because they pack the medicine cabinet with like everything you could possibly need and it does go missing occasionally. But, like, <laughs> but this is the thing is that like fentanyl does have an actual medical use. Yeah. That's yeah. the first time I ever heard about it was when I was a paramedic and mm. then like fast forward several years I'm like, why is everybody screaming about fentanyl? Oh, right. Okay. I mean, like to be fair, being in the ISS is essentially like being in a goon cave because yeah. you're constantly masturbating but never coming. <laughs> someone's gonna, someone's gonna like bust into like a Ziploc bag or it's gonna float around. <laughs> you just see this jar with a My Little Pony in a floating glass. <laughs> no! <laughs> I mean, they have to keep it. Like, they can't let it float around. It's just a port on the front of the spacesuit, and then if you open just it, labeled the, cum. The, well, like, yeah, the, the pressure just evacuates it into space. You just shoot alone, and it goes across the room like a fucking bullet and kills someone. <laughs> Rest in peace, hero. You'll never be forgotten. <laughs> the fate that Buzz Aldrin would have had if he was born like 50 years later. Buzz Aldrin's still my favorite astronaut because he punched out a guy on video. And he was like 60th. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Like uh, the, the fucking Bart Seibrel, the moon landing conspiracy theorist, who was like, hey, like, uh, swear on this Bible that you went to the moon. And he's like harassing him. His granddaughter is right there. And he just fucking decks him. <laughs> get, get one fed to you by 60 year old Buzz yeah. Aldrin and going down, too. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that, like, you know, getting hit by a six year old wouldn't hurt. But, no. like, if you're recording yourself harassing an old man who was in the military, like, you have to assume, like, he might throw a punch. Yeah. And then you take one on the jaw clean, and he like, Buzz Aldrin wins. He's actually just like training in the hyperbolic time chamber, like Goku. He's super strong, and he hits you, and you just go <laughs> through the wall. Just turn to dust. I desperately want to see someone doing like kung fu training on the moon. <laughs> it's like Buzz Aldrin getting ready, kicking someone. Just like also only man to ever drink alcohol on the moon. He brought like a little thimble full of communion uh, communion wine with him. Hell yeah! He was just like that Catholic. It's because the Irish haven't gone to the moon yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, like, they're, they're all, like, Irish descendants. Doesn't count. You can't take them away from us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> shut up. The, the, the diaspora can't count when they do something good. Has <laughs> There's no Armenian diaspora who's ever been on the moon. No, Fuck they just you. go to L.A. <laughs> I mean, just as equally fucking desolate. Uh, what's his What's his fucking name? Uh, Bogosian, I think, was the first Armenian Armenian American in space. So uh, there has at least been that, but... And he immediately started trying to steal the catalytic converter from the rocket. <laughs> so the first real Soviet attempt to militarize space came in the early 60s as Sergei Korolev was trying to get his new Soyuz program off the ground. And if you've heard of that name, that's because that's the thing they're still using today. Uh, they've just like upgraded it and upgraded it and upgraded it, and it's, uh, it routinely vents oxygen... It gets put together really bad. Prime Russian engineering that I've come to respect. Yeah, fu fun fact, their, their like rocket QA actually got worse after the fall of the Soviet Union. That's actually like the same across the board for everything. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out that works for tanks. Rockets, it's more <laughs> iffy. So he wasn't content with being the first to like put a satellite up or a man in orbit. He wanted to go to the goddamn moon. But at this point, the Kremlin wasn't convinced, and he was having trouble securing funding. And so... He did what he always did and what a lot of military contractors do when he needed money. He pitched his spacecraft to the military. Specifically, he told them that with all of these spy satellites being launched, the Soviets would need a way to destroy American spacecraft. And this is like a serious consideration at the time. The Cuban Missile Crisis is going on. 
and tensions are very high. Naturally, the Soviet military bought into this scheme immediately and gave him billions of rubles. Fuck yeah, that's like six dollars. <laughs> <laughs> JFK was like, I believe the Russians are going to space. They gotta build a space MiG. <laughs> I thought you were about to say a space mech. Hold that thought. <laughs> Hold that fucking thought. I mean, they did build a Wait, space mech. <laughs> they, they, they really did, like, plan on a space mig, Like a space interceptor. Yeah. They bolt those things together with, like, sheet metal. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> oh. So, his idea was to design two modified spacecraft for the military. One, the Soyuz R was a tiny tube-like space station that would keep a couple of intelligence officers alive for months as they took pictures of the U.S., so it was just a man. Put him in the tube. It was a man to spy sat because they figured that like oh like a people up there would be able to take better pictures than just like a remote controlled camera. But these guys are just living in like a space much smaller than this room for months on end, just stinking it up nonstop. That's gonna end in a murder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how you get to like two thousand and one a space odyssey. You, get, you, you so you're gonna <laughs> stuff two poor bastards in a tube and give them like disposable cameras and be like see you in six months, losers. <laughs> yeah, like you have. Yeah, you've got one of those little like wind up cameras. You have five pieces of film and all of them are just like you mid murder of your colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, and the other much more interesting idea was the Soyuz P manned orbital interceptor. Now, if hearing that makes you imagine some kind of like sci-fi starfighter, I'm going to have to disappoint you. The, the Soyuz P was basically a copy of the civilian Soyuz craft. Uh, like it didn't even have weapons. And if you're wondering how an unarmed spacecraft was supposed to destroy Wait, a satellite. Net gun. Hold that thought. Fuck. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's a Wiley Coyote no, shit. Yeah, yeah, but it's dumber. The actual thing is dumber. Uh, so if you're wondering how it's going to destroy a satellite, don't worry, they thought of that. So how the Soyuz P mission would work is that if the Soviets wanted a satellite destroyed, inspected, or even captured, they'd scramble an interceptor to it. Um, this meant that like a flight crew, uh, these craft would need to be fueled and ready to go at a moment's notice on the ground, and like their crew would just have to be nearby in case, like, get up there right now, we need it destroyed in an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because getting to space is as easy as launching a plane. Yeah, this is something that is like notoriously tough to do for space, especially mm. with the old rockets back then where they had to be like, they were liquid fueled, it takes hours to get them going. Just like gooning. You have to, you have to warm them up. I'm also liquid fueled. <laughs> <laughs> They're rubbing the fuselage. <laughs> and... I don't know if I can say this uh, with lines led by Donkey's host, but it does get worse. There'll be five dollars, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your Patreon subscriptions going up. <laughs> so once the Soyuz P had intercepted its target, a military cosmonaut would have to suit up, go on a spacewalk, float over to the satellite, and take it out. Like in hand-to-hand -hand combat. <laughs> He <laughs> squares up with a fucking satellite? Like, what's going on? What would your guy's Call of Duty loadout, like, primary, secondary for this guy be if he's going to take out a for satellite? For fighting a satellite. We are, we are deploying Boris to destroy the satellite. He is armed with nothing but a spoon and jar of mayonnaise. I'm going to say some kind of screwdriver and something like a space hammer of some kind to okay, hit so it really hard. Okay, so you got the second part right. Uh, oh, I, I, and I did say whenever we were chatting before that landmines would be involved. So oh, he's, explosives? He's going, he's going up there with a hammer and a landmine. So he's Just like a regular landmine? So, well, I assume like a space kind of thing, like he could, like a magnetic uh, yes, a mine, he mounts it on it. Does he have to like hit it with the hammer to trigger it? That's what it? the screwdriver's for. He's got to fiddle with it a bit. Step one, affix landmine. Step two, hit landmine with hammer. Step three, receive hero of the Soviet <laughs> Union medal. Step four, we build a bust of you in your home village. Step five, we forget you ever existed. Little bits of you will rain down on the Soviet Union. <laughs> we'll fertilize the people's crops. Th that is like, completely in line with Soviet military strategy in general. It's like, step one, step two, step three, die. Yeah. I mean, like, imagine sitting in this this briefing where you're, at, like, a highly trained astronaut with, like, years of fucking training, plus you probably were a jet pilot before then, mm. and you're like, you want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> you, you want me to what? <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's, uh, that's actually kind of a funny thing with the Soviet cosmonaut corps was that at first, it was basically a demotion as far as, like, what they could be expected to do. It, they needed to be the best of the best pilots, but then they become a cosmonaut, and they don't get to control their craft anymore. They don't have space stations, so they can't actually do shit. 
Mm. You might be able to fly, but we have found you guilty of being gay. <laughs> you can now fly, but space. you will not be landing anymore. You cannot be gay in space. You, you have been sent to, yeah, like, grabbing people from the Shiraga and forcibly shoving them into the rocket. You've been <laughs> sentenced to space. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's an, I'm, I'm ripping space off an onion gulag. article from that, yeah. I think I wrote about one of those in one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> what, an onion article? No, those, those get paid more. After an inspection, and if destroying the target was the plan, the cosmonaut would have to figure out the best way to do that without getting himself killed because like every satellite is non-standard the soviets don't know what these satellites look like you just got to play it by ear if you can break it with the hammer sure if not affix the mine set the timer and run and like float away as fast as you can i feel like that's a fixed amount of speed and, uh, the, like, and then, like, like, don't worry, our R&D development for the space landmine is zero, so we just stole some from Yuri over in Quartermaster Unit, and, uh... The entirety of the cosmonaut training is just barbell squats, so you have super <laughs> just, strong push strength. Push off. I mean, to be fair, their weightlifting team was pr pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, if all went to plan, he'd then float back to the Soyuz P and continue his months-long orbital deployment, because once he's up there, they just he's just gonna stay in there for a little while. He's got a, a whole bunch of landmines. This is some, like, Warhammer... 40k orc shit. Yeah, it's about to get a lot dumber because How? If, if, they wanted to, if they wanted to capture the satellite, which again was a serious consideration at the time, the cosmonaut was supposed to ratchet strap it to the front of his, his spacecraft like it's a goddamn deer. So he's supposed to do the same thing like my stepdad did whenever he found like a, a, a discarded couch on the side of the road, but with a fucking satellite. And you can't, like, I don't know what they were planning after that point because you can't like re-enter the atmosphere like that. It's the satellite is super flimsy, but you just have yeah. your, your spacecraft with a, it's going to turn into a 40k space hulk because he's just gonna like katamari like all of these satellites together <laughs> just tumbling through space <laughs> no ever just, growing just collecting i am yuri god of satellites Vo it's just V'ger Voyager from that Star Trek episode, it's, <laughs> except it's like a 60, like an 80 year old Soviet dude controlling it. As yeah, it's a 60 ISS. I could never come back down to Russia and I prefer it this way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 60 year old, like old cosmonaut riding the rocket down like the end of Doctor Strange. <laughs> so like, if you're going to capture the satellite, hypothetically, I suppose you could spacewalk over it and like get a good look at it or something. But like, even if the satellite didn't burn up on re-entry, which I assume they all would, I assume as a non-space guy, I'll say comfortably, you can't just add a whole other spacecraft to your spacecraft and try to land your original spacecraft. I, I, That's not how anything <laughs> works. No. I, I wonder if uh, that, like, this was either the inspiration of, because I can't remember whether it proceeds it or not, for, like, the ending rocket scene from Rendezvous with Rama. Like, the co cosmonaut just floating over and disabling, and it's like, okay, just float back. Was a single scientist even, like, in the room when some politician came up with this idea? Definitely not. We'll get to that a little bit. Korolev did not actually give a shit about these designs. He was fully just doing this to get the bag and then go and build his moon stuff. I can support that. Yeah. Secure your moon bag. So, thankfully, even the Soviet military wasn't crazy enough to think this would work and they quickly demanded a redesign. Uh, and this would become the Soyuz PPK, a manned interceptor that removed, like, the front onion-shaped HAB module, which means that it's got even less room to actually live in, and it replaced it with a multiple launch rocket system that, that fired what the Soviets called rocket mines. It would, like, magnetically affix to the target, push it away with its rocket engine, and then detonate. This is just, the, like, a recipe for creating a kamikaze cosmonaut. Yeah, but knowing the Soviet Union, like, Definitely wouldn't have worked because, like, some guy in the manufacturing actually, like, sold the springs. He pointed the rocket, like, the wrong way accidentally them in and backwards. it just fires into the cosmos. <laughs> the, the, real, the real kink in this whole plan is every single one of those rockets is controlled by a dog. <laughs> 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 Rest in peace, Laika. Never forget. Yep. Now, fortunately for the world and unfortunately for us, none of OKB-1's batshit starfighters ever flew. It's also worth mentioning that Korolev never put much faith in the design and only viewed them as a way to get military funding for his lunar program. So much so that he never actually worked on the design and just subcontracted them to some random nobodies. <laughs> which I can support. We're, sub we're subcontracting the death wagon. Yeah. <laughs> Joe has the same production mandate. <laughs> this is, it is kind of the equivalent we'll of give if, it like, to the Irish. <laughs> if Lockheed just decided they didn't actually care about the F-22 and just subcontracted it to like a university flight club or something. Just give it to Daewoo. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> 100% a guarantee in this whole program there is at least one Irish guy working on this. There's, there's always at least one. There's always one. Someone's got to find out a way to how to increase rent in space. 
<laughs> they hired two I guys can't from wait Dublin. until yeah, the cost of living reaches even like the billionaires doing private space stuff. <laughs> it's just, like getting evicted from your space condo, just floating off. They just hit a button and it vents you into <laughs> the, the void. God damn, the price of moon milk is going up. Fuck. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't Korolev's dumb ideas that sunk the project, it was actually his rival, Chelemay. While OKB-1 was designing manned space interceptors, OKB-52 was developing the Istrebitel Sputnikov, or Destroyer of Satellites. Okay, sweet name. Yeah, yeah, they did. <laughs> sweet name. I'm, I hope the font on the side of it was, like, sufficiently metal. Yeah, it had to be, like, the metal band names that <laughs> have that font you can't read. That's how you know how metal they are. It's because they can't write either. Uh, this was an idea that was a lot closer to the ASAT anti-satellite systems we have now. Basically, a satellite bolted to an ICBM that it just launch at a specific target and, like, ram into it at Mach 30. <laughs> okay. And that is what they use today. Like, you get vaguely close to a satellite, you just fire off, like, a shotgun of debris. And that's also why there's, like, huge death clouds of debris that the ISS has to dodge all the time now. Because <laughs> China and the U.S. got... Uh, yeah, China and the U.S. briefly got into like, a, oh yeah, I'll destroy this satellite. And now there's just like, gravity is possibly going to happen. Uh, I like <laughs> the idea that the ISS is full of people at the time that's happening. Like, man, I really hope they don't miss. <laughs> <sighs> and, and this is also like, this is where we get to the fun Soviet politics part of it, because like, while the Soyuz project was running into delays and design problems, Chelemay's IS program was running successful test flights and hitting targets. To make matters worse, because the rocket meant to launch the destroyer of satellites was being delayed, Chelemay asked the Kremlin if he could steal a couple of Korolev's rockets for his tests, and they actually said yes. <laughs> so, and that delayed the Soyuz program even more. So he's like just going, hey, you've got rockets, uh, Kremlin, I need those for my test. And suddenly all of the rockets this other OKB built, has built are just, like, nationalized. And being turned into weapons. Yes. Hell yeah. So, yeah, these, these guys are, like, constantly fucking each other over. Every OKB is just run by the slimiest fuck imaginable. Yeah, what if you had a million Lavrenti barriers yeah. running a space program? It's so oh, I, I don't have it here, but, like, famously, Glushko, the guy who made all of the engines for all of the uh, Soviet rocket programs, famously hated Korolev. And because he makes all the, the engines, he can shut your program down if he wants to. Like, if you're building a rocket to do moon stuff, and Glushko is like, no, fuck you, no engines. Like, you're, you're screwed. That's kind of how, like, the, every Soviet level of management worked from the, the most piddly nothing to someone that runs <laughs> something important. is like, when they got in charge of something, they treated it like it was their personal fiefdom. And that's actually a kind of um, like managerial style that still exists in Russia and a lot of the parts of the former Soviet Union is like you have this absolute fucking moron who, you know, glad handed had you know, privileged his way into this position. And it doesn't matter if he runs like the local DMV or like the immigration office in your neighborhood or like the military come start fucking anything. He runs it like he's like a noble. And until recently uh, in the Russian space program, that was a guy called Dmitry Rogozin <laughs> who fucked up military procurement so bad he got he got demoted to being head of their space program. And then he went to Ukraine and got his ass shelled. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine starting off working in the space program and getting turned to dust by a fucking artillery shell manufactured in the 60s. <laughs> so it, it, he, they found out that the shell was sent by France. So he, he got the debris dug out of his ass and sent it to Macron as like an own. Macron just that got is an, an own, just not the way a, he thinks it with is. With a little bit of this dude's ass in it. Like, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's an own, but like... To him. Like, bro, you started out, like, running the space program and managed to get shrapnel wounds. Like, that is falling so far down the ladder, you're about to be bayoneted. Yeah, but I don't want to make it sound like Chelemay just blew past Korolev with, like, a sensible plan and good ideas. Because even if the IS satellite worked well, a lot of Chelemay's success was just down to shrewd political maneuvering, which basically meant sucking up to Khrushchev as much as possible. Unfortunately, Korolev was already Khrushchev's favorite, so Chelemay had to get creative. He hired Khrushchev's son, Sergei, to work for him and immediately made him a senior engineer. <laughs> now, I want to be fair, it's massive nepotism and basically bribery, but Sergei Khrushchev now is actually this, like, incredibly accomplished rocket scientist. He actually does eventually earn his role and be, like, very much a leading figure in the field. He's breaking the field of Nepo babies. Yeah, this is my thing, is, like, uh, everyone goes on about Nepo babies. I don't really care about Nepo babies if they're good at what they do. Like, the Nepo babies who, like, 
oh, I'm like an artist and their shit is like, yeah, like it's kind of a waste. But if they're actually really good, I'm like, who really cares? It's it's kind of like the um uh, the one of the daughters of the president of Azerbaijan has like a national gallery in Baku. Um, she's a complete shit artist, but like spent like millions upon millions of dollars building her her own gallery. It's like, well done. I think it's like, uh, was it Ceausescu's wife was the head of science yeah, as yeah, well? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it because like she had no interest in science, but she hated her daughter who actually was a scientist? Probably. It sounds, it sounds like a ceausescu <laughs> thing to do. We know how that ended. Ah, uh, yeah. Sometimes history has happy endings on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so for Chelemay, on top of the Kremlin, he also aggressively lobbied the military which was starting to kind of sour on Korolev. So Korolev famously started his rocket program by talking about how this would be like the world's first ICBM. And then uh, the R-7, the Soyuz rocket, is the world's first ballistic missile. <laughs> it's clearly meant for space stuff. It uses liquid fuel. Like if you're trying to launch a nuke at America, this thing takes like 12 hours to prep. If America is nuking you with like thousands of bombers, this thing is not going to get a shot off. Right. So the military is like, no, fuck this. We need a better rocket right now. And that's kind of where Chelemay tried to break in. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said I'd build the first one. I didn't say it'd be a good one. And and the other attempts to make this, uh, like the R-16 rocket famously explodes on the pad and like kills 100 people. Yeah. Um, because they're trying to like work with the, like the most hazardous fuels imaginable that'll asphyxiate you, melt you, light you on fire, crush you with pressure, give you cancer all at the same time. To the point, like, no one's sure what will kill you first medically. Good news, it's the fireball. So, Chelemay tries to get into this by, like, filling a gap with his new, he calls it the UR-200 missile, which means uh, versatile missile 200. What made it versatile is that it could conveniently launch a lot of other Chelemay projects, like the IS. So, the military, like, may as well just pick all of those as well. Like, we have this rocket that can launch all the Chelemay brand registered trademark stuff. So <laughs> just buy all the rest of it. Like, again, this is just, like, all of these, like, slimy fucks doing, like, corporate company shit. Right. For the Soviet military. Unfortunately, things didn't really work out for Korolev or Chelemay. OKB-1's Soyuz P Starfighter program was, start, uh, was shut down in 1965 in favor of Chelemay's IS unmanned satellite killer. However... Chelemay then got out-politicsed by a different rocket scientist named Yangle, who was building his own rocket to compete with the UR-200. For reasons that no one is completely sure of, even his own son, just a few days before he got cooed out of power, Khrushchev went to Kazakhstan to watch a test launch of the UR-200 and this, competitive, uh, this competing rocket, the R-36. Quote, In the wake of the visit to Baikonur, Khrushchev made the decision to terminate the UR-200 project in favor of the R-36. In his memoirs published in 2000, Sergei Khrushchev still pondered the question why his father preferred Yangle's R-36 to the UR-200, saying, I don't know why, since the rocket seemed almost identical. So, <laughs> he's working on this cool rocket. His dad shows up, congratulates him, shakes his hand, cancels the project immediately, and then a few days later gets cooed out of power. <laughs> and it's just like, nice. <laughs> so in the end, what would happen is like Chelemay's satellite killer would get bolted on to the competing R-36 rocket. And that is what the Soviets, that's what Russia is still kind of using to this day. They just put these things in silos and have not used them in 50 years. So they're just, they're just sitting around Moscow, technically ready to go. I have a feeling if they hit the go button on that, it would just make Moscow glow. <laughs> Just like crater the size of Ukraine in <laughs> Russia. It'd cut a hole to the center of the earth and kaijus would start coming out of it. <laughs> they may just have Pacific Rim. <laughs> the throw is in Moscow. So I know that was a lot of acronyms and code names and this guy scheming this guy, uh, but I wanted to go into detail just to give you an idea of like how fractured and political the Soviet space program was. Militarized Almaz stations. Now, the IS satellite killer wasn't Chelemay's only attempt to put weapons in space. And I want to be clear, this isn't just a him thing. All through the 50s and 60s, both the Americans and Soviets were dreaming up ways to militarize space because that just seemed like the reasonable thing to do back then. There was a lot of debate between governments and bureaus, but none of this was about whether space should be militarized. It was just which kinds were better. Quote, space designers in the U.S. and the USSR considered a whole spectrum of manned military spacecraft, including orbital bombers and interceptors. However, ultimately automated systems proved to be cheaper and more reliable means of deploying weapons in space. 
Still, the use of human eyes and brains seemed promising in space-based intelligence. Proponents of manned space espionage argued that the presence of people in Earth orbit armed with powerful reconnaissance tools could provide careful selection of targets and quick reaction to fast-changing developments on the battlefield. Uh, this is presumably ignoring the fact that you're orbiting like 40 minutes around the Earth, so you're not exactly looking at any one place for long. Yeah, they still gave it a go. Hey, you can listen, sometimes you, just, you don't know until you give it a try. Yeah. And, and if the military's interested, all of these OKB guys are not going to say no. They're going to take their <laughs> fucking money. Yeah, they're doing the equivalent of, for most men, the sexual adventure of getting a finger in the bum. <laughs> no, no, until you like it until you yeah. try it. <laughs> no, this sounds like it's that would be much cheaper than a space program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly after taking over the ASAT mission from Korolev, Chalamet started working on his own manned military spacecraft. Like Korolev, he saw positives in the idea, basically that a person in orbit could respond a lot faster and have better data than a person guiding a satellite from the ground. And all this sounds good in theory, but the Red Army wasn't convinced, and they especially hated the price tag. Chalamet's project, which he called Almaz or Diamond, seemed doomed to live only on blueprints and in his dreams, until the CIA came to the rescue. Of course. Yep. Woo! Here come the spooks. <laughs> I was wondering when they would show up. Around the same time, the US was starting work on the Manned Orbital Laboratory, or MOL. This was basically uh, an old Gemini capsule bolted on top of a small space station that would allow the crew to spend months in orbit. On paper, they'd spend that time running experiments and measuring the effects of zero-g on the human body. You know, science stuff. In reality, however, the MOL was actually a secret spy platform, and the station would come equipped with powerful camera banks, weapons, and a massive inflatable radio antenna for spying on the Soviets. Well, yeah, naturally. Uh, we have ascertained the threat and we are deploying <laughs> the, uh, America's strongest pervert. He is equipped with a thousand X uh, magnifying <laughs> binoculars. He might be looking in your window, but he's also looking at Soviets. <laughs> he's trained his whole life for this moment. You want to talk about space gooning inside the MOL is just a fucking snow globe. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know, he spends 15 minutes out of his 40 minutes looking at the Soviet Union, and then the next 25 minutes looking in women's windows while yeah, they're well, getting changed. contract, you know, you have to honor the contract. Yeah. Now, the MOL is definitely something we'll be covering in some future episodes, but for now, it basically died for a lack of initiative. No one wanted to spend much time or money on it. NASA was wrapped up in the moon race, and even the Department of Defense wasn't convinced of the idea. In the end, it'd fly one unmanned mission before being canceled. But for Chelemay, none of that mattered. Quote, in the charged atmosphere of the mid-1960s, over-optimistic statements by the U.S. Air Force about its role and impressive but often unrealistic depictions of the MOL lab, widely published in the American press, provided plenty of propaganda for Chelomey to lobby for a Soviet response. So, he just does the thing that happens over and over in the Cold War, which is like one side releases some big propaganda about how cool they are, and the other side, whether cynically or actually, takes it seriously and just goes like, Fuck, they're doing it. We got to do it. Give me money. Yeah. That's how you secure the bag in the Cold War. Yeah. This is famously why um, America, like, winds up with a shitload of bombers is because the Soviet Union's try to do... The Soviet Union tries to do some, like, Maskarovka shit and pretend, like, we actually have hundreds of bombers. Look. Yeah. They fly the same bomber over the, the same crowd over and over. And America doesn't buy it, but they still, like, the public does. So they're forced to, like, buy thousands of these bombers. Yeah, I have a girlfriend, she just goes to a different school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bomber, just goes to school in Canada. So the Kremlin, they buy this. Chelemey gets approval in 1965 to build his Almaz stations, first as reconnaissance platforms, but also to experiment with weapons. We're not quite to the weapons yet, because we still have to talk about some politics. So, first thing, even though the program gets approved in 1965, it doesn't actually get started for another four years. Part of this is because the moon race is siphoning off resources, and the rest is because when Khrushchev left office, Chelemey lost his biggest cheerleader and got to work with the Minister of, of the Defense Industry, Dmitry Ustinov, who fucking hated him. <laughs> uh, and he immediately wasted no time. So Ustinov, like, on top of these OKB guys hating each other, they also, like, develop fandoms in the government. So That's Ustinov, so strange. Ustinov is a big Korolev fan, and he actively helps with, like, red taping all of the projects Korolev doesn't like. Yeah, it's like Japanese idol stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm into idols, but it's actually just, like, weird Soviet scientists. Yeah, like, leaning, leaning on the government to black bag the rival idols. Ustinov's Kor just becoming a VTuber. <laughs> Korolev going around doing meet and greets like he's in Blackpink. <laughs> they have strict rules about not having boyfriends as well. Yeah. When Almaz's first design trials were started in 1968, Anatoly Kirillov, the deputy chief of the Baikonur Cosmodrome, and a devoted Korolev stan, started a commission to try and find flaws in the design. 
When the report came back mostly positive, Kirillov just purged the commission and all of its members and rewrote it himself to be all about how horrible Chalamet's design was. Now, OKB-1 did not just try to sabotage the Almaz program for the sake of it. They did it because OKB-1 wanted to compete. When Apollo 11 landed on the moon in 1969, it effectively killed the Soviet moon program, which was always handled, like, entirely by OKB-1. So losing the moon race basically put them out of a job. And so, when they were looking for something else to do, they noticed a rival OKB working on space stations, and they wanted a piece of that action. Now, as a side note, the head of OKB-1, Vasily Mission, who we will talk about, hated this idea. He was the guy who had replaced Korolev after he died from hernia, and was a massive disciple of Korolev's vision. He, like, he wanted to keep going to the moon, basically. He mm. argued, like, even if we're not first, we put all these resources in it, we have to. Um, which kind of makes sense. But, and this is where it gets fun, a rogue faction of Soviet rocket scientists in OKB-1 disagreed, and they decided to make this happen whether their boss agreed it to or not. While Mission was on vacation, they went above his head, they went to his boss, and gave him a proposal for a program to cheaply and quickly build a fleet of space stations using off-the-shelf parts. <laughs> I went down to the hardware store, boys. I have an idea. Building a rocket out of uh, reappropriated IKEA furniture. <laughs> now, you might be wondering where they plan to get off-the-shelf space station parts from, considering that no one had actually built a space station yet. Um, and their idea was just to steal from the Almaz program, to kind of get them back for the rockets that Chalamet had stolen. It's off the shelf. Well, it's off someone's shelf. Fuck yeah. Em. Quote, they aimed to cannibalize the hardware developed by Chelemay's collective for the troubled Almaz program and build their own station outfitted with recycled systems from the Soyuz spacecraft. And this project would eventually become the much more famous civilian Salyut stations. So this is where the orbital line brawl happened. <laughs> and where, like, three dudes uh, died in space. In the end, both projects got the green light in 1969, meaning that the USSR had two independent and competing space station projects, of which Salyut was somehow given high priority right off the bat. Uh, it was even decided to make the Almaz program secret and credit every launch as being part of the Salyut program, which also meant giving OKB-1 all of the credit for all of the launches. Of the seven Salyut stations launched between 1971 and 1982, three of them were actually these secret Almaz stations. Now, that's some politics, but we're here to talk about weapons. Of the three Almaz stations, Almaz-2 is easily the most interesting. Almaz-1 failed shortly after reaching orbit when it got shredded by the exploding rocket stage that had actually just put it in orbit. <laughs> <laughs> so it gets into orbit, it detaches the stage, the stage immediately detonates and just like, it's gone. <laughs> Thankfully, the stations were launched unmanned. Almaz-3, the last one, got a few crews who performed some military experiments, but they mostly just did space experiments like looking at the fish in the aquarium, which apparently handled space good. Wait, fish are okay in space? Yeah, the, I, I assume if they're, like, they've if you keep them all in the water, they might have some trouble swimming around, but they still got, like, they can still do their stuff. Yeah, I mean... They, they can still fish. Yeah, I mean, also, I suppose, like, fish's organs are designed to be suspended in water, so... Yeah. I mean, as long as they have water to swim, I don't think they fucking notice where they are. Yeah, just, like, putting, you know, like, a fairground fish in a bag on the <laughs> rocket. <laughs> I, I'm more surprised that, like, even though these were military space stations designed to do, like, secret military black ops shit, they still put some actual science experiments. They still, or maybe it was for, like, morale that they just gave them Mr. Fishy. <laughs> did, did they have to enlist the fish into the Soviet military first? Oh, fuck. When the fish dies, where does it float to the top of? Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> shit. We, we've broken the system. It just, maybe it just stays in the having, middle. Having to sadly vent Mr. Fishy to the void. <laughs> you know, giving, it a, giving it a full Soviet, like, uh, military funeral. We cannot allow this fish to re-enter and be found by the Americans. One of you's gonna have to eat him. Comrade Fishy, your sacrifices will never be forgotten. <laughs> Press F to pay respects at Comrade <laughs> Fishy's funeral. That's the first Almaz and the third one. Almaz 2 did not have an aquarium. It had a gun. A 23mm Richter R-23 autocannon literally ripped off a Soviet bomber nearby Kanur, was bolted to the skin of the space station, and given the code name SHIT-1, which means SHIELD-1. Uh, <laughs> that just lines up very well. Um, I'll show you a picture of it. But why? Oh my god. For shooting stuff. Did it work? Yeah, they test-fired it. In space? Yes. Fuck yeah. Fire firing a gun in space or underwater isn't that difficult because the bullet has its own fuel and oxidizer and it's all, like, airtight. Yeah. Mm, okay. So firing in space isn't a problem. Because the idea of Almaz was that they'd be military reconnaissance hubs, if a war ever started, they'd probably be priority targets for the Americans, who were also building their own anti-satellite and, like, space interceptor shit. Yeah. 
The Soviet solution to this problem was to give it a big gun to shoot at anything hostile that floated nearby. So, like, the idea was they would just be able to intercept the ASAT as it was coming at them at Mach 30. My comment of them slowly turning into Warhammer 40k orcs is still kind of tracking here. <laughs> um, now, there were some problems with the design. Like, the gun didn't gimbal. It was just bolted to the skin, so you had to actually, like, aim the whole station. <laughs> <laughs> a problem a problem fixed uh, in military vehicles in World War I. <laughs> and also, it is just bolted to the skin. There, there isn't, like, a mounting bracket or anything. like. And the skin of a space station it's is very millimeters thin. thick. Mm. So, so when it fired it, there's probably a real possibility it's going to fuck up the whole space station. They were not able to fire this thing a lot because they were worried, like, the wear and tear. If it wore too much, it would just, like, rip the entire thing off and well, vent That's what the I was going to say. <laughs> also, once you got it pointed in the right direction, it did not have a gun sight. You'd have to peek out the window and kind of eyeball it. Because... <laughs> peek out the space window. Yeah, and again, the thing that is coming to kill you is moving at Mach 30 relative, and you're just, like, firing blind at it with a fucking anti-aircraft gun. You're just gonna fucking wing it into orbit. That if you fire too many times, and this is also space, so, like, heat is going everywhere, this gun is either going to melt or it is going to rip a hole and, like, vent you. And if you're if, if there's one situation in which winging it isn't a good idea. It's everything to do with space. Yep. So in the end, the shit one was never fired in anger, but it was fired uh, for tests three times, and it apparently worked well, uh, but not well enough to ever use it again, so they scrapped it. The coolest weapon of this era never actually got to fly. Learning lessons from shit one, the shit two was a space-to-space -space missile. Basically just a space sidewinder. Shit two, even shitter. <laughs> Here's a picture. It may be kind of hard to see, but like, it's a rocket stage, and this huge fragmentation charge mounted on top. <laughs> and was this also just eyeballed it? Like, there's no sights on this one either? This one, this one, like, uh, the front of it is an active radar tracker. Like, I guess it's more, it's closer to an AMRAM, because okay. it has its own radar. It is able to track the target, move towards it, and detonate when nearby. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, like, this thing just fit in a tiny little container, so you could theoretically mount this thing on anything. It, it had its own, it didn't rely on radar or any kind of special hardware from the spacecraft. Um, it was just kind of like modular. So it was a meter long, it had a range of 100 kilometers, its own radar guidance, and this like weird fragmentation warhead made of 96 tiny rockets, which also doubled as the missile's second stage. So the bomb part, it would kind of be continually detonating to push itself along and guide itself in a weird way. It's pretty metal, yeah. not going This bomb is propelled by more bombs. <laughs> by bomb. yeah. Um, the idea was that the rockets would all burn together and direct the missile, and, like, the detonation would just be them disconnecting. So they'd have all these rockets that are continually burning, and then they just let go of them. Um, and that's the explosion. They don't, it doesn't actually detonate, it just sends a bunch of mini rockets free all over the place. Oh, okay. While the first test was meant to be just two missiles on a space station, if successful, there were plans to bolt the shit too onto any spacecraft where it had fit. One idea was to load a Soyuz with a bunch of them to effectively, like, remake the Soyuz PPK a manned anti-satellite interceptor. Fortunately for the world, but unfortunately for me, the shit too never got to fly. The station that was meant to test them, the Almaz-4, died when the program lost its funding. And both the Almaz-4 and the shit too are still in a warehouse in Moscow today. Free my shit too. Fire it into space. I still want to see if it works. I, I, to be fair, I think we're like three months away from them trying to fire it at Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, they're going to send attach it to a T-55. <laughs> it's actually funny. So the shit too was developed in Ukraine, and that's that um, method of guidance is used by like a modern Ukrainian missile, where like it has these little rockets on top that like burst fire in different directions to guide it. Oh, interesting. Soviet orbital battleships. Okay, this is uh this part I've been very excited for. So far we've talked about space stations with guns and space to space missiles. The wildest idea was probably having a cosmonaut, you know, smash a satellite with a hammer or blow himself up with a mine. That's my personal favorite. And it's about to get dumber and admittedly a lot cooler. Now, not content to let Chelemay and OKB-52 steal all the fun of building armed space stations, OKB-1, now like renamed to NPO Energia, decided to try it themselves and get very crazy with it. Just like Almaz, they had a space station design that gave them a lot of room to work with, and a lot of room to bolt weapons to. Starting in the mid-70s, with tacit approval from the Kremlin, Energia developed the Skiff and Cascad battle stations. The idea with these was pretty simple. Take the core module of, like, a space station, tear out all the science equipment, and replace it with weapons. Fuck yeah. Yeah. 
Now, unlike the earlier Almaz stations, these weapons wouldn't be for self-defense. These things were not meant to be like reconnaissance or control stations. Both Skiff and Cascad were designed from the start to track and intercept targets, staying in orbit for months on end and like actively doing patrols and like battle fleets of their orbital zones. What the fuck? I know. These things are orbital battleships. <laughs> um, so I'll show you a quick picture to kind of give you an idea. It may be a little hard to see. One on the left is the missile boat. One on the right is the laser cannon. So it's just a salute station is the main core, and then they've just bolted shit to the front of it. It looks like a firefly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, to be fair, look, I, I appreciate the ingenuity and the fact they're being sustainable by, you know, they're not manufacturing new stuff to bolt it onto. They're using what they already have. They're being yeah. circular. I Someone mean, else's station. Along with a laser cannon. Yeah. But sure. I mean, do lasers create waste? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. They're, they're a chemical <laughs> nightmare. You have, to, you have to launch so much weird shit for them, and which we are going to talk about later. As for the differences between the two, it came down to weapons and the orbital altitude that they would be, like, operating in. Skiff, meaning Scythian, mounted a goddamn laser cannon that it would use to blast defending satellites from a safe range. But because the laser weighed like several metric tons and ate into the fuel range, Skiff would be meant to operate in low Earth orbit. Cascade, meanwhile, meaning Cascade, was appropriately armed with a 10-tube missile launcher. Uh, and because of how light the missiles were, Cascade had room for a little bit of extra fuel, and it would patrol all the way out to geosynchronous orbit, which... For context, is about 36,000 kilometers or 22,000 miles from Earth. God, what a shitty posting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially because, like, there's very little need for that. Yeah, you're never going to do your job. You're just going to be sitting in this box, like, <laughs> thinking about how to, like, kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> or gooning. Which would be, like, sending the missile out, getting it to turn around and come right at you. In the sense it's a Soviet-manufactured missile, that's just on the packaging. <laughs> Another thing that made these designs unique was how they would operate. If the earlier Soyuz and PPK can be considered like fighter jets scrambling to intercept and destroy a single target, Skiff was supposed to be more of an orbital destroyer, cruising low Earth orbit with enough fuel and ammo to take out several targets. Cascade, meanwhile, was designed to act a bit like a submarine, floating out near geosynchronous orbit in stealth mode with no radio contact before sneaking up on its targets and firing space torpedoes. In both cases, the crew would be in for long rotations, and while the inside of a Salyut was spacious compared to, like, the smaller spacecraft they had, living in one for months on end was expected to be hellish. God, imagine how bad it would smell. Oh, fucking horrible. I mean, I feel horrible. like that's any space station, right? Like, it's got to be fucking disgusting. <laughs> yeah, like, being in the army... Like, how like, well can you clean that? Yeah, like, being in the army just means you're subjected to smells all the time. Yeah. But, like, being trapped in the space cube... The, the, this is a one-way mission. These dudes are never coming home. <laughs> like I said, the Soviet, as is still the Russian military tactic, is step one, step two, step three, die. <laughs> now, as the 70s went on, Energia had a lot of spare salute lying around, but not a lot of spare funds or manpower. Uh, the closest they got to ever launching anything was a plan to test the Cascades missile on some unmanned Progress spacecraft, and even that had to be cancelled. In a bid to try and get at least the Skiff laser station off the ground, Energia decided to outsource the work to a new sub-bureau called KB Salute. So these guys also have, like, front companies all over the place. They're, they're doing company shit. Right. Now, who is KB Salyut? KB Salyut is a rogue breakaway faction of ex chelame engineers and scientists who defected from OKB-52. <laughs> Specifically, okay. this, this, the way I imagine this is just like if a Boeing company, if a Boeing factory suddenly had a, like a, a violent revolutionary overthrow and then flew the Lockheed flag instead. Well, I mean, I feel like then that they're, the, the, the parts of their airplane would stop exploding off. Coming over here, I, I, I flew on a Boeing, and I was just like, yeah, my flight is delayed, my plane is incredibly iced over, and it's designed by Boeing. And you still made it here. I did, yeah. Unless you're actually dead, and this is just all, you know, the afterlife. Podcast purgatory? You're trapped never... in a velvet line studio for all time. <laughs> you're never leaving. It's like Hotel <laughs> California. So, specifically, KB Salute were the guys who had designed and built the military Almaz stations, and when they defected, they took most of the hardware as well as an entire factory with them. They Why are... the fuck do you steal a whole factory? I don't know. This is this is not just like quitting and leaving and going to the competitor. This like they took shit with them. They emptied the warehouses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I fully support stealing from your employer. If you can steal a whole factory, more more power yeah. to you. It's like that Johnny Cash song, One Piece at a Time, where he builds a car over the course of twenty years. 
is like sneaking out nuts and bolts in his lunchbox. They're just doing this. Just slowly sneaking out an entire space station factory. I mean, like, to be fair, it's a Soviet factory. You could probably wrap a rope around it and pull it behind you with a donkey. <laughs> and everybody else is also already stealing from yeah. it. Yeah. And I need to be clear that stuff like this happened all the time. OKBs were in a constant process of annexing each other and then balkanizing into a bunch of tiny rival bureaus. Like, <laughs> they were doing the fall of the Soviet Union fully 30 years early they're just doing soviet shit i mean yes. that's, that's what the soviets were doing with all their autonomous oblasts and yeah shit. like what they needed was they needed the space race tito to hold everything <laughs> together so that's why the balkans have never gone to space <laughs> so <laughs> this actually got so bad that valentin glushko um sergey korolev's famous rival who got him sent to a gulag wound up in charge of his bureau <laughs> if things yeah he just winds up running the show and like there's stories of him like taking all the korolev portraits down in the office just like wiping his ass at them like, yes <laughs> <laughs> i win motherfucker <laughs> anyway kb salyud gets given the task of building the laser death star in 1981 and starts making some decent progress however this was not a good time to be making laser death stars the political winds in moscow had shifted so in 1962, just a few months after KB Salyut was given the space project, Yuri Andropov becomes the new general secretary of the Soviet Union, and he's not a fan of laser death stars. Who's not a fan of laser death stars? Everybody should be. Yuri going Andropov, apparently. Going to a political debate and asking both candidates what their stance is on laser death stars are. This is what needs to be in the next presidential election. <laughs> uh, every, everyone Trump loves laser yes. Yeah, Trump would love that shit. Everybody would. It's like things that you draw in your journal when you're... Yeah. Six years old. <laughs> uh, so in the Soviet Union, part of this is because he wanted to make some rapprochement with the Americans, and part of it is because the project was just a blatant violation of the 1972 anti-ballistic missile treaty that the Soviet Union had signed. I disagree. Um, because this is cooler. Like, yeah, this treaty is voided because look at this glorious motherfucker. Uh, we're going to enact subsection 12, rule of cool? Yeah, of course. So under Andropov, work on the skiff was effectively frozen. Uh, like the Almaz before it, it looked like the Soviet Death Star would only exist on some blueprints. Also, like the Almaz, skiff was then rescued from the dustbin of history by an unlikely savior, Ronnie Reagan. Okay. Yeah, he was a pretty big fan of putting weapons in space. Yeah, uh, listen, Ronald Reagan, the only, Ronald Reagan did one good thing. Die? Only, well, he, that, so two good things, die and the no-fault divorce. Is that him? Yeah, that was Ronald Reagan. No shit. I'm not handing it to him. Okay, two I good refuse. things. I, I refuse to hand anything to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you that was purely for him. Did he? No, he... It was probably for, like, I mean, he, he came divorced? out of Hollywood. It was probably for his Hollywood friends. <laughs> Maybe it was like a just-in-case measure if things ever soured between him and Nancy. And then he just got, like, horrible dementia, so he didn't, rem <laughs> he didn't remember he was married anyway. Yeah, she sucked the thoughts out of his brain. <laughs> God. See, in 1983, Reagan had announced the start of the Strategic Defense Initiative, or what's famously known as the Star Wars program. The idea with this was they would build a network of anti-ballistic missile satellites in orbit that would, like, completely nullify a Soviet nuclear launch. While this might sound reasonable, and both countries definitely had anti-ballistic missile systems on the ground, Star Wars made the Soviets and a lot of the world very worried because if it worked, it would erase the concept of mutually assured destruction, mm -hmm. giving America the ability to, like, negate the Soviet nuclear capability. Um, it would also mean that America would then be free to nuke or threaten anyone with no, like, while being immune to retaliation. I don't see the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they're doing thing. it anyway without the threat of nuclear <laughs> war. Look at everything they've done for the past 60 years. I mean... Just freedom and democracy, you know. All around, yeah. Enduring freedom. Yes, I'm sure the people of North Vietnam love Mountain <laughs> Dew. To be fair, they actually do. Probably do. <laughs> Vietnam, huge fans of the U.S. these days, actually. <laughs> Vietnam loves Dew and the Dew. <laughs> now, Star Wars is something that we'll definitely be covering, probably in like a whole series. Uh, because it was a legendarily bad idea and a waste of billions of dollars. But for now, just know that the Soviets took it very seriously and started to ramp up their own anti-Star Wars program in response. Wouldn't that just be like the Sith program yeah. or something? <laughs> well, we've got the shit program, so Sith isn't too far from that. The, the anti-Star Wars program would be like the Babylon 5 program. Yeah, or <laughs> yeah the Sith program, they're just like, Okay, you can copy my homework, just change it up a little bit so it doesn't look the same. So this was made a lot easier in 1984 because Andropov died and was replaced by Gorbachev, uh, who was a, 
Like, despite his modern reputation, he was really into militarizing space back then. Flushed with cash and with approval of, from the Kremlin, KB Salyut was then ordered to build and launch the Soviet Death Star. The Soviet Death Star. Now, with the funding also came a change of mission for the, uh, the military stations. Where the first goal had been to patrol multiple orbits and destroy the American satellites and missiles, the program shifted entirely to countering American Star Wars program and, like, blowing up its anti-missile stations. Uh, because the Americans weren't going to deploy any of their stations to high orbit, the missile-armed Cascade was scrapped entirely, and because of how many American st uh, stations the Soviets believed would soon be launched, the laser-armed Skiff needed a major redesign. Quote, For the laser project, KB Salyut came up with an entirely new design, namely a 40-meter-long, 95-ton object that would be built at the Khrunichev factory and launched by the Energia rocket. The engine section would be a modified functional cargo block, the main part of the transport supply ships, originally designed by KB Salyut to transport crews and cargo to the Chelame Almaz stations. So uh, th that's a lot of a techie way of saying that, like, they're going to build the biggest, dumbest thing ever launched in human history. And before going any further, I want to give some context on just how huge this satellite was. 40 meters long and 95 metric tons makes it heavier than the American Space Shuttle or the entire Skylab space station. Oh my god. It was roughly the size and shape of a small submarine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll show you a picture of it uh, here. Because all the things required to create a laser is, take up a lot of space, right? Yeah. Like it's like a ton of different chemicals and shit. That's like something that you would build in Kerbal Space Program and like that your picture first is two actually hours. stolen from Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will find all credit whoever made that that I stole the picture from. There's no good pictures of the actual laser battle station. Part of that room is for the laser, like you said. Part of it is for the nuclear mines. The what? We will get. To. <laughs> uh, now, unfortunately, KB Salyut started immediately running into problems. We're at 1984 at this point, and the Kremlin wanted Skiff launched by the end of the 80s. So this is an incredibly tight timeline. Even if the engineers could reuse a lot of old Salyut and Almaz hardware, the laser was far behind schedule, and like they still didn't have a rocket that was even capable of launching it. And I want people to pay extra attention for this part, because it gets a little complicated with the names and acronyms. Even though it's a new spacecraft from the old Skiff, KB Salyut's planned 95-ton Death Star they keep naming it Skiff anyway. But to meet the Kremlin's deadline, they came up with a stopgap measure named Skiff D that'd fly with a smaller test laser the Soviets were already testing on aircraft. So this is like, you've seen the pictures of like the 747 with a laser bolted to it? Yes. Mm -hmm. The Soviets have that. They have one of them. It is on an aircraft. They're not going to build another. They're going to rip it out of the aircraft, shove it into a Skiff satellite, and call that like Skiff D. I love the idea. Sure. I love the idea that like this rolling into the 90s meant that fucking Boris Yeltsin got to be in the cockpit <laughs> with the laser. <laughs> and you know he's like been blackout drunk for like a month. Just like doodling onto the earth with he's the like, laser. What does, what does this big red button do? <laughs> I just, he's just trying to get more Domino's pizza. <laughs> he, he's coming out and like falls over and sets off the laser <laughs> and it kills a hundred people. Famously, he's in the past out drunk in like the, in, in the front lawn of his house in like Washington, D.C. when he was staying there. Yeah, yeah. Like, sure, there's a, there's a, I'm trying to remember where. In I, his underwear, if I believe. Where it was, it was like some visit he was doing where he was like so drunk he couldn't get off the plane. Yeah, they just say he had a medical condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how, how, like, how drunk does a Russian have to be for other Russians to be like, he's too drunk. How, do, how drunk does the leader of Russia have to be? How do you think he became leader? They uh, don't elect the sober one. No, Dude, but it's, it's just like the, uh, like the, oh, I'd vote for him. He'd have a drink with me. It's just like, no, he's having a drink with every constituent individually back to back. Uh, yeah. But like, this is, this is so funny. Cause like I read that, um, book about the failure of Perestroika. That's like about like Gorbachev and like the rivalry between him and Yeltsin is so funny because like, he thinks Yeltsin is a fucking idiot. He's like, well. oh, he's like, because <laughs> like Gorbachev like saw himself as this kind of like elevated parochial intellectual. Like he's like, oh, you know, I, I'm, you know, came for, as an outsider and like now I'm in power. Whereas like Yeltsin's like very brash. He's not talking about like theory and like he just like beats him because he's more likable. I can imagine why. Yeah. Uh, so in the end, Skiff D would have two test flights. Skiff D1 would fly without the laser to test all the other systems, while Skiff D2 
would use the small laser that they ripped out of a plane, and it would launch some own targets and whatnot to shoot at. Mm -hmm. So we're already cutting the plan down to meet some deadlines. And it's about to get a lot dumber, because in 1985, before even the simplified satellite is ready, KB Salyut is ordered to launch something, anything, on the Soviet Union's fancy new rocket, the Energia, and also to meet a holiday, which is our favorite thing on this show, which is wouldn't it be nice to have something for the holidays? holidays. Yeah. Yeah. And they love rushing complex programs to get stuff out for Christmas, (laughs) and then it explodes and kills people. Hey, listen, it's the it's near the end of the Soviet Union. It's the only thing they're getting for Christmas. <laughs> now, we will definitely be talking a lot more about the, the Soviet space shuttle program Buran and its failure. But for now, it was basically designed to match the American shuttle with a few key differences. The main one is that how the engines are set up. So in the American space shuttle, it's got its own main engines and the big orange tank is just fuel. The Soviet system was a little different. They put the rockets on the booster and they just bolted the Buran shuttle to the side as payload. So what this meant is that the booster, which is named Energia, could fly by itself, carrying other cargo than the shuttle. So what happens is in 1985, the shuttle is not ready or they can't launch it. So they have this booster sitting around they need to use. So they just go to this other uh, company and just say, hey, you have a payload. Launch it now or this rocket goes to waste. Mm. So they, and the, the, the payload is not ready. They don't even have, they haven't even got the laser off of the plane yet. So they have to launch an even more cut down thing called the Skiff DM with the M standing for dummy at this point, um, which they gave the name Polyus. Basically in the rush to meet the Kremlin's de- a timeline, KB Salyut had to dumb down their design twice. Even though Polyus had some basic targeting and sensing equipment, it didn't have the laser, it didn't have fuel, it didn't have turbo generators, and the interior of the satellite was so empty that the Soviets offered just a bunch of universities the chance to fly their experiments on the hyper Death Star just to to fill up space and add mass. They (laughs) they added like a load of concrete, like it had to have the same mass as the final thing, like reach 95 tons. And eventually they're just like going to kids like, yo, do you want to like throw something in there? Have at it. You want to be a fucking (laughs) cosmonaut kid? Get aboard. (laughs) Get in. They're like two weeks away. We're going to concrete you in. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> getting jumped in as a cosmonaut <laughs> you just have all these prisoner <laughs> scientists kicking the shit well, out of we, you we talked about getting rid of the bodies like fully like putting someone in concrete shoes throwing them in the skiff dm and then just launching it <laughs> then our favorite thing happened again soviet politics see gorbachev was still trying to play the peacemaker publicly and convince reagan to cancel the star wars program and he didn't want to be called a hypocrite because his country was building an orbital death station Quote, Clearly under political pressure, the state commission in charge of the flight decided in February to cancel all the battle station-related experiments, namely deployment of the targets, tests of the laser pointing mechanism, and release of the xenon and krypton gas. So like it had a bunch of these like very minor experiments that they have ready. Save for the technological and geophysical experiments, Skiff DM would now essentially fly a passive one-month mission before deorbiting itself into the Pacific. So it is further dumbed down. They can't even use, like, the very limited shit they have. I love when I <laughs> deorbit myself into the Pacific. <laughs> so in spite of all of these challenges, Polyus was delivered to the Baikonur Cosmodrome in mid-1986, having been virtually built from scratch in less than a year, uh, which in rocket terms is incredibly quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of technical delays, it then sat outside unprotected in the Kazakh desert for seven months. That seems which bad. Does not, which does not do favors to rockets. Great for the farmers, though. Yeah. Then, so after it gets mounted to the rockets, further delays meant that the whole rocket assembly spent three months exposed on the launch pad, surviving temperatures between minus 27 and plus 30 degrees Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> rockets famously very weather durable. Oh, well, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture. It's covered in snow. That's bad. Now, the reason that was delayed was so that Gorbachev could come look at the rocket, even though he really didn't want to. When he showed up in early May, he pretty much spent the entire tour shit-talking the rocket and the whole idea of militarizing space, even though it was his idea, before reluctantly telling KB Salyut that the Kremlin had approved the launch. And while KB Salyut was hoping that delaying to let Gorbachev visit would like, earn them some, pol- some political brownie points, like he gets to see the rocket and see how cool it is, it wound up being a horrible idea. By delaying until mid-May, the engineers had given themselves an incredibly tiny launch window. Flamingo breeding season was fast approaching. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and if they did not launch, and if they did not get the rocket off the ground before those birds started banging, the program would be stalled again. The space program was defeated by flamingos? Yes. Fucking flamingos. Why were the Soviets so worried about fucking flamingos? Uh, it's it's because of like environmental concerns and also because the breeding like location is 
very close to American territory. So basically, where the rocket is, pl they have two options for like where to launch, uh, where to launch like in the direction and whatnot. One of them is going to land in the, like the flamingo breeding zone and just drop like a hundred tons, like several hundred tons of liquid death on these flamingos. <laughs> like their, their option is either do a good launch, do a, a bad launch right now or risk blowing up flamingos. Or creating the lamest superpower of all time, <laughs> Flamingo Man. <laughs> He's the power to balance on one leg for a very long time. And so on May 15th, 1987, Energia 6SL, which is the name of the rocket, left the launch pad in Baikonur Cosmodrome, carrying the Polyu Skiff DM very dumbed down laser battle station. There was some initial concern because when, and you can find video of this if you're on YouTube, you'll see it right now, when the rocket immediately veered off the launch pad by about <laughs> 10 degrees, you can see it take off and then immediately drift a little bit and kind of correct itself. Whoops. Oh, oh, oh. Two minutes into the flight, the side boosters separated, and seven minutes after that, Polyu separated from the main Energia booster. Although the rocket had done most of the heavy lifting, the satellite still needed to get itself into the final bit of orbit with two burns from its tiny engines. And then things went very wrong. Oh no, the flamingos. <laughs> it's, it's just birds striking flamingos all the way up, like plowing through a, a flying V of flamingos. It's just a big plume of pink feathers. <laughs> See, because of how it was designed, Polyus had to be mounted to the Energia rocket upside down. Once it separated, it had to then spin itself 180 degrees to point its engines in the right direction for the final burn. When the fateful moment came, Polyus spun 180 degrees as planned, and then it spun another 180 <laughs> degrees, and then it burned its engines at full blast, slowing itself down and causing it to deorbit in the Pacific, somewhat close to the flamingo breeding season no! place anyway. It did not hit them. Dude. My flamingos! <laughs> Dude, like a, a fucking laser flamingo is going to come out of that wreckage somehow. A, a kaiju-shaped fucking, like, kaiju-sized flamingo bursting out of the no, Pacific. No, you would be so pissed if you had ordered a custom flamingo feather boa like just gets incinerated by a Russian <laughs> rocket. So a lot of explanations out there uh, will say that there was like a bit flip or some other software bug, and it's actually dumber. Quote, Later analysis showed that the thrusters had been deactivated by a command usually issued during a TKS launch that had somehow not been erased from the pole use launch. So because they're using <laughs> off-the-shelf shit, they just left in the old software and never bothered to like comment it out in the code. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> because... This old TKS thing is not designed to do the upside down. It flips upside down, and then this old code is like, oh shit, we're flipped upside down. Let's fix that. I, I, it was infiltrated by intelligence agents of like the Flamingo Corps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this cannot be allowed to go ahead. Quack. Rogue, rogue naturists <laughs> yeah. sabotaging the police. They launch. should have known. There's like, you know, in the, in the lab. At the OKV, is like human, human, weird pink human on one leg, human, human, human. <laughs> Gor Gor <laughs> like guys, we're, like Gorbachev is here. It's just a flamingo in a trench <laughs> in a trench coat. Gorbachev is actually Thank six you. flamingos packed into oh, a bad you, Soviet you, like, suit. Oh, you're squawking about the code, sir. It's right over here. David Attenborough check. has always been a CIA <laughs> asset. That's right. Now, the failure of Polyus effectively spelled the end of the Soviet counter to Star Wars. Like a lot of space programs during this period, it didn't really end all at once. It sort of sputtered out. You can make the argument that it was sputtering out even before Polyus actually launched. Because, again, this satellite was getting dumbed down and down and down and down and down to the point that it didn't even have the real uh, weapons, it didn't have the laser, it didn't have the nuclear mines it was supposed to carry. Like I said, this fate was common for space projects at this time. For better and definitely worse, the Cold War was a huge motivator for space research. Programs like Sputnik and Apollo were funded for the propaganda value, while Star Wars and Polyus were greenlit out of sheer political paranoia. When all that started to ramp down, it became much harder for space programs to justify their budgets, and many actually collapsed. The American Freedom and Soviet Mir-2 space stations only survived by actually merging to become the modern ISS. The Buran program, meanwhile, literally collapsed when the only shuttle to fly it was destroyed when its hangar collapsed and killed six engineers. <laughs> Sorry, eight, eight engineers. Flamingo's at it again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other Buran orbiters are scattered around the world in various museums or being sold bit by bit on eBay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole market of space junk resellers, and you can find like the pictures of the actual Buran shuttle in Moscow. It looks pockmarked because people come in and just rip the heat shields off and sell it on eBay. A buddy of mine has a chunk. <laughs> you can just buy that shit. Um, and that, everyone, is the story of the Soviet Death Star. 
How do we all feel? Ah, uh, only like late Soviet era scientists would create something as just ridiculous as this, and only the politics of the late Soviet era could create something like this. Right. It's one of those things. It's like you knew it had to exist at some point in the history of militarizing space, but then when you get down to the minutia of it, you always end up very surprised of how intensely dumb it was because you always assume like scientists aren't going to do really dumb shit yeah but then like flamingos get involved i I don't know man even whenever the scientists don't think it's a good idea it all comes down to like what the politicians want yeah Mm -hmm. but yeah thank you guys again for coming on our show oh thanks Um, for having been a blast joe Joe was being occupied with the japanese space space food food. (laughs) it's very dense (laughs) (laughs) can't get it open Yukio Mishima will be fucking furious. You have to cut open the dense fucking cube. So if you guys want to plug your shows, I'm sure all of our listeners are already familiar. Uh, Beneath the Skin, show about the history of everything, told through the history of tattooing. Uh, I am the host of Lines Led by Donkeys podcast, where we do not talk about flamingos. Yet. Yet. Emu War. uh, Close enough. It's their chaos cousins. Yeah, emus are just Australian, you know, flamingos. (laughs) <laughs> and listener we do have a patreon so if you subscribe to that you get a monthly bonus episode where we uh, right now we're just reviewing bad soviet space movies but we are going to expand that out and you help support the show help us buy research materials and uh help with our hosting thank you thank you to everyone who has signed up to support the show and a big shout out to all of our top tier patrons our cyborg cats our boss matt leaf goose and specter cohen our space dogs ben l fractal moonlight furious luddite John C., Oliver, Tom M., and Zim. Albert Count, seven. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to follow us, we are Failure to Launch on Blue Sky and FT Launch Pod on Instagram. We also post our episodes with visual aids at Failure to Launch Podcast on YouTube. All music was provided by DJ Danner.